We're in a really diverse pasture here. There's probably 12 or 15 different species uh, in this pasture. We've got oats, rye, vetch, plantain, chicory, peas, radish, the list goes on. If you were to turn this field upside down and were able to see what is happening below the soil, you would see that there's a tremendous diversity in root architecture. So underneath our radishes, we've got these big tap roots that are going down and opening up the soil. When these plants die off, these roots decay, leave a big hole in the ground for other plant roots to follow down and to, of course, cycle the nutrients that are left behind by this. Similarly with chicory, I wasn't able to get to the bottom of this plant. It's not particularly big, but already it's got about uh, 200 millimetres of root on it. Uh, that's got a diameter of, what's that, about at least 10 uh, millimetres. So that's going down a lot further into the soil. So when we look at the different architectures in the soil, we see that there's some plants with relatively small root systems like this pea, but we've got nodules on this pea that indicate that this plant is fixing nitrogen and in a system like this, we know when we've got cereals growing in conjunction with a, a nitrogen fixing plant, that the output of nitrogen from the nitrogen fixer is greatly increased as the cereals and other plants scavenge nitrogen from this plant. That nitrogen then is cycling through the system for other uh, species to use. Uh, and um, uh, as is the case with other nutrients and with the carbon that is constantly being pumped back into the soil, as these pastures get grazed off. There is a proportional dieback in the root system following grazing, and that represents a pulse of carbon back into the soil, which the microbes get stuck into. So nature, they say, abhors a vacuum. And one of the things that we really seldom see in nature is a monocrop. Uh, nature has, has evolved to, to share space with many, many plants. And we know through some really lovely research that plants share resources and work together uh, usually through microbial bridges. There was a one recent lovely piece of research that showed how the shallow rooted millet growing in conjunction with a deep rooted pigeon pea was able to share water resources that the shallow rooted millet wasn't able to reach through a mycorrhizal bridge. So this, this is an example of the kind of thing that we're looking for when we plant different species in close proximity to each other. So with multi-species cover cropping or multi-species vegetable production, whatever we're doing, we're chasing stability. We're trying to promote stability in the soil's ecosystem. So what we're talking about in effect is biological control. And biological control is something that is happening all the time. We tend to think of biological control when we have a problem. We need to bring in an agent to control the problem. But actually, when we have a beautifully healthy field of crops like this, biological control is happening now. It's what is contributing to the health of the system. No agent is out of control. All agents are in balance. So we've talked quite a bit about uh, diversity under the ground and diversity under the ground maintaining stability in that system. Diversity above the ground, of course, is equally important. And what we're seeing here is a range of different plants, different plant architectures, different types of flowers, providing dip different habitat for insects. So we have a layering effect in this landscape. The broad term for this is habitat modification. And habitat modification is essentially introducing habitat for a broad range of organisms to come in and help control the balance in that particular ecosystem. In the middle of this uh, layout, we have a line of native plants that are attracting native insects that are flowering fairly continuously throughout the year and providing a steady supply of energy and attractive elements to those insects.